Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar, which is a joint effort between the Norwegian Institute for Defence Studies, the Oslo Nuclear Project at Oslo University, and the Royal Danish Defence College. I am Kjell Ingebjerga, Director at the Norwegian Institute for Defence Studies here at the Defence University College at Akershus Fortress. We have a timely and important subject at hand today, namely the blurring of the lines between nuclear and conventional weapons. Traditionally, we have thought of nuclear and conventional weapons as two distinct categories. Of course, they still are, but with technological change and the advent of advanced non-nuclear strategic weapons, the distinction is becoming less clear-cut than it used to be. That shift has major implications for both great powers and small states, including Norway. It raises new opportunities, including for the deterrent strategies of both great powers and small states. However, the shift also raises many crucial challenges. And that is what we want to discuss today. I think today's webinar demonstrates the close ties between researchers and institutions in the Nordic countries. The Royal Danish Defence College is one of the most important international collaborators for our institute. We have had a formal collaboration agreement with the Defence College in Copenhagen since 2014. And there are strong bonds between individual researchers. Today I am pleased to have our former colleague Ian, who joined the Danes some years ago, back again, at least on screen. Oslo University and the Oslo Nuclear Project, headed by another former IFS colleague, Målfrid Braut Hegghammer, is another important collaborator for us. We are very glad to join forces with both institutions to arrange today's webinar and look forward to further close cooperation. I am also very happy to see that a vibrant community is forming in this part of the world on the classical security issues of deterrence, strategic stability and nuclear weapons. During the Cold War, strategic stability and deterrence used to be key concepts and part of the standard vocabulary. And we had a strong community in the Nordic countries working on these issues. After the end of the Cold War, nuclear weapons seemed to be partly forgotten and a lot of scholars left the field of strategic studies. But the bomb never went away. And with the increase of great power rivalry and an increasingly challenging security environment in both Europe and Asia, these are issues that are very much back on the agenda. While that might be unfortunate, it is nevertheless important to understand how it will affect our security. As part of this, there is a need to update some of the classical work in the field and analyze how technological shifts will affect strategic stability and deterrence relationships. More fundamentally, there is a need to develop new expertise on these issues, both in the research community and in the policy world. I think today's webinar demonstrates that while there is more, more work to be done, we are starting to build a strong foundation. The introductions today build on publications in two of the top journals in the field, and that shows that we have a pretty strong group of young scholars emerging in the Nordic countries. A difference from the Cold War is that some of the most important trends we are seeing in international security are happening not only in Europe, but also in Asia. There might be some lessons to be learned and some warnings to be had from the developments we are seeing in Asia, such as South Korea's novel deterrence strategy. Um, even though South Korea and its relationship with North Korea is very different 
from that which, say, European states have with Russia, particularly in terms of relative, relative capabilities, the technologi technological shifts may produce similar effects. More broadly, I think today's seminar will demonstrate why Asia matters. Here at the Institute, we are bolstering our Asia research and we have an excellent Asia program. Of course, Russian strategy is still very much a key interest to the Institute and we are delighted to have another former IFS colleague, Kristin, present her work on Russia's blending of nuclear and conventional deterrence. Again, a very warm welcome. Thanks for joining us. Now I will leave the floor to Cardinal Eggen, who is a research fellow here at the Institute. And I am confident that she will take us safely through the webinar. Cardinal? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the director of the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies for that great introduction. And now that you all are up to speed, um, uh, I would like to say that it is, I do apologize. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties here. Um, is it okay? Yeah. Perfect. So uh, now that you're fully up to speed, uh, I would like to say that it is a great pleasure to chair today's seminar. Uh, like Schillinger uh, just said, my name is Kaida Nana Egen and I am a PhD fellow at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. Uh, I will begin by uh, giving you some uh, practical information about today's program. We will have two presentations. The first one is uh, co-presented by Ian By Bowers and Henry King, and the second presentation is uh, from Kristin Van Bruskoy. I will introduce the speakers as we go. After the introductions, we will move to the discussion and Q&A sessions where you will be able to provide your comments and questions. Uh, because this is a digital seminar, you uh, we'll have to type in your questions in the Zoom chat function, which should show up on your screens. And I will make sure to include as many questions as possible. Also, please note that today's uh, seminar is recorded. Uh, so if you would like to rewatch uh, after this, or uh, perhaps share it with friends or colleagues, you may do so by visiting the homepage of the Norwegian uh, Defense University College, uh, and it should be available in a couple of days. Uh, if you cannot find it, please do not hesitate to contact us. So with the practical information out of the way, uh, I would like to introduce the first two speakers. Ian Bowers is an associate professor at the Center uh, for joint operations at the Royal Danish Defense College. He was, uh, prior to that, he was an associate professor here at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. He holds a PhD in war studies from King's College London, and his main research interests are deterrence, sea power, and international security in East Asia. And with him to present is Henry Kim, who is an associate professor at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. He was formerly a senior researcher at the Norwegian uh, Institute of International Affairs. Uh, he holds a PhD from the University of Oslo and is interested in nuclear arms control and strategy, international security in East Asia and Chinese foreign policy. So Ian and Hendrik, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Karn uh, Anna. Um, it seems I can't share my screen just yet. Um, I have some slides that I wanted to put up. Um, anyway, I'll I'll just get started. Uh, thanks, Karn Anna, uh, and thanks uh, also very much to Kjellinge for that uh, kind uh, 
introduction and welcoming remarks. Um, I agree, of course, very much that uh, both nuclear issues and East Asia um, are back on the agenda and, and matter a lot also to, to um, European security. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to get to present this work, which is the result of uh, happy, at least from my perspective, collaboration with, uh, with Ian. Um, and the starting point of our introduction or presentation is that we have entered a new nuclear era where nuclear weapons are very much back uh, on the agenda at the heart of international security. Um, but in this new era, the line between conventional and nuclear weapons are becoming more blurred. Um, or to use another term, um, nuclear and conventional weapons are more entangled than they used to be. Uh, and the implications that this may have for strategic stability and arms control, uh, that is a topic which is gaining a lot of um, traction and interest. Um, and that is because this tendency has a very significant impact on the nuclear policies of the great powers, uh, including Russia and the US, uh, and increasingly, of course, also China. Kristin, uh, I believe, will speak more to the Russia side of uh, things later. But we argue that this tendency may have a profound impact also on states without nuclear weapons and that there is a need to understand and think uh, more about this. Um, in addition to us saying something about the emerging security uh, climate on the Korean Peninsula, one of the broader aims of our article was to contribute to this debate um, based on an analysis of South Korea's strategy to deter a nuclear armed North Korea through conventional weapons. Um, one may of course argue that South Korea is a special case. They are a very, very sort of capable middle power and they are located in a very dangerous neighborhood. But we believe that the South Korean case illustrates some of the profound changes that non-nuclear weapons are having on strategic stability. And even if other countries may not copy the South Korean strategy, it's possible that they could draw inspiration from it. And uh, whether or not that's a good idea is of course open to debate, but uh, nevertheless, this is something Ian will, will speak a little bit more about later. So uh, the plan is basically that I will start off by saying a little bit about why nuclear and conventional weapons are becoming more entangled and uh, some of the potential effects it may have on non-nuclear states. Uh, and then Ian will introduce the South Korean case. He will also say a little bit more about uh, the policies and capabilities of, of other non-nuclear actors. Um, so just to start from the beginning or the outset here, why are nuclear and conventional weapons becoming more entangled? Um, well, the main reason is that nuclear uh, arsenals are becoming more vulnerable to non-nuclear capabilities. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, basically that the arsenals in themselves, as in the actual weapons, the missiles and the missile launchers, are becoming more vulnerable to strikes from non-nuclear uh, weapons. But perhaps just as importantly, all the supporting and enabling capabilities that nuclear forces rely on uh, are becoming more vulnerable as well, uh, including command and control networks and communications uh, networks and so forth. Um, and this is a profound change because during the Cold War, discussions about counterforce, that is, I mean, attacking the nuclear forces of an adversary, uh, they were based almost exclusively on nuclear weapons. But now it's possible, at least in theory, to rely on conventional weapons and capabilities for counterforce strikes. You can debate how credible it is, and we'll get back to it, but nevertheless, this is a uh, sea change. It's, it's a major difference from, from the Cold War. Um, in terms of capabilities, um, what are we talking about? Um, I would argue that the main shift is the so-called precision revolution and the advent of high precision conventional weapons. Um, I mean, high precision conventional weapons have been around for a while, but it's a recent development that so many more states are acquiring or considering to acquire such capabilities. 
and they are uh, crucially enabled by a revolution also in remote sensing or in advanced intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities. And that's important to stress because without such remote sensing capabilities, um, high precision, well, doesn't really work. Um, to, to uh, identify and track potential targets, uh, you need such, uh, such capabilities. In addition to conventional precision strikes, there are other capabilities that matter too. Uh, missile defense technology is becoming much more mature. Um, counter space capabilities are also becoming more potent. Uh, that includes both kinetic and non-kinetic counter, uh, counter space capabilities. For example, early warning satellites that were previously thought to be off uh, limits or, or, or invulnerable are uh, currently becoming more vulnerable. Um, you also have cyber weapons, which are difficult to assess from open source sets, but which may constitute an increasing threat to command and control and communications uh, networks. And all of these capabilities need to be seen sort of in combination. So for example, even if it's still really, really difficult to intercept a large number of missiles, states can, for instance, rely on conventional precision strike to try to target the nuclear forces of an adversary, and then rely on missile defense to intercept the uh, remaining missiles. Um, it could further rely on cyber and counter space weapons to target command and control. Um, the question then is, what does all of this imply? Um, well, as mentioned, most of the debate so far has been on the effects on strategic stability and arms control between the great powers. And that's unsurprising because, I mean, many of these capabilities are still quite advanced and um, states such as uh, the US and Russia have a commanding lead in developing many of, many of them. But there are nevertheless some, some very significant implications for non-nuclear states too. Uh, because in principle, the advent of advanced non-nuclear weapons may enable states to, um, or states without nuclear weapons, to develop conventional deterrent strategies to deter nuclear armed adversaries. Um, and there are two ways that, I mean, conventional weapons may deter. Um, you have deterrence by denial, which is basically uh, attempting to deny an adversary a nuclear strike capability. And to do that, you have to attempt to hold all nuclear weapons at risk and, and threaten to strike all of them in the event of a conflict. Uh, of course, that's extremely challenging. Even when you face a smaller nuclear armed state, such as North Korea, it requires identifying and tracking a large number of targets and striking all of those targets, um, intercepting any uh, forces that remain within a very short uh, period of time. Uh, and if deterrence break uh, down and you're in a conflict, you can't afford to miss because if a single weapon gets through, um, you're in a lot of trouble, obviously. Um, but even if it's very challenging, it may have a deterrent effect because just the prospect of failing may be enough to make nuclear armed states more cautious. In addition, the advent of conventional precision strike also makes it easier to rely on deterrence by, by punishment. And that could entail uh, striking uh, targets that the adversary values. Uh, those targets could be leaders um, under the assumption that leaders want to survive a, a conflict. This is also, I mean, an extremely complex thing, but perhaps less so than, than, than targeting the nuclear forces of, of another state. But on the other hand, threats against leaders are potentially also very destabilizing. Um, of course, these two modes of deterrence are not mutually exclusive, and South Korea relies on both of them. Um, I mean, they threaten both the North Korean arsenal and the leadership, which, which Ian will address in, in more detail. Um, let me finally just mention briefly some of the challenges that such strategies pre uh, present. Um, I mean, we already mentioned credibility, that this is incredibly hard. Um, but another challenge is that um, if you uh, try to threaten uh, the nuclear arsenal of, a, of another state, that state is most likely going to respond, which may lead to, to an arms race. Um, to make matters worse, it's generally speaking cheaper to build nuclear weapons than to build the advanced conventional capabilities that you need to threaten them. So a 
non-nuclear state would have to invest potentially a lot in not only building a, a conventional strike force, but also in maintaining it. Um, the other main challenge that such strategies uh, face is that they may lead to an increased risk of nuclear weapons actually being employed, um, being used in the conflict. For example, if an adversary fears being disarmed in a crisis, it may face incentives to actually use its nuclear weapons. Uh, that's the familiar use them or lose them dilemma. And perhaps particularly disturbing, if you threaten the leaders of another state, they may have very legitimate reasons to refrain from negotiating during a crisis because they may fear that establishing communication could make them vulnerable and um, they would potentially have no reason to hold back. Um, so, I mean, overall, these trends, these uh, shifts present non-nuclear states with some uh, pretty significant new opportunities in terms of developing new deterrent strategies, but they raise some very significant risks too. Um, and I will pass it on to Eden to describe those um, in the South Korean case. Uh, thank you, Henrik. Just let me see if I can share my screen now. Um, yeah, thanks, Henrik. Uh, it's, it's very nice to be back and working with uh, EFS again, albeit online. And as Henrik says, I will be looking at how uh, South Korea is using conventional uh, systems to counter North Korea's nuclear strategy. And initially, I will just look at you know, how they are doing this, and then some of the rationales behind it, some of the implications of the peninsula, and then I end up with how some of these issues may arise in other theaters, particularly maybe things we should think about in Europe. So let's start with what is South Korea's conventional counterforce strategy? Well, going back to the early, to, early 2010s to mid 2010s, South Korea, looking at developments over the DMZ, decided that they required a response to North Korea's nuclear program. Now, obviously they were limited by the fact that they could not develop their own nuclear weapons or restrained from doing so. And they, they hit upon the use of conventional capabilities for both counter force uh, and counter strike capability um, approaches. And really, what they have developed or what has evolved in the years after is kind of a three prong approach. The first is the kill chain, which is essentially deterrence by denial. It is a set of systems, um, sensors, command and control, and strike systems designed to preemptively destroy North Korea's WMD infrastructure, including uh, command and control nodes, uh, missile launchers, missile storage areas, and things like that. So the key to that is, is that it is preemptive. Now, beside that is the massive punishment and retaliation approach or strategy, which is denial by punishment, which is designed to use much of the same systems to uh, destroy or target high value uh, targets in North Korea. And what I mean by high value is targets that are of high value to the North Korean leadership, inclu including you know, uh, leadership compounds, Pyongyang, Kim Jong-un, Summer House, wherever it may be, but things that he values. And this will be enacted if North Korea launches an assault on South Korea. So it's designed to threaten severe punishment should North Korea do anything. And then the third element is missile defense or what the Koreans call KMD or Korean Air Missile Defense System, which is a integrated multi-layer missile defense system designed to catch anything that the kill chain misses. Now there's two elements that are, that are worth kind of emphasizing about this. One is, is that it's designed to be independent from the United States. And what I mean by independent is that it can work with the US and there are exercises where the US uses their systems alongside the South Koreans, but we don't know the exact details. But if the US for some reason is not involved in the, on the defense in the peninsula, South Korea would have the ability to deter North Korea independently from them. And that is a very important point. Secondly, as Henrik states, conventional counterforce is extremely difficult. And arguably on the Korean peninsula, it is even more difficult. And two or three of the reasons are one, the geographic theater or the operating theater is very, very small. And this reduces the uh, amount of warning time or lead time South Korea would have in the case of a North Korean attack, forcing South Korea to maintain a substantial number of forces 
at high levels of readiness. Um, and also, it's important to note that it is unlikely that North Korea would only use nuclear weapons if they were going to attack South Korea. So North Korea would likely mingle conventional and uh, nuclear weapons together, which would force South Korea to not only enact its counterforce uh, strategy, but also its defense of, uh, of South Korea itself, which takes up a lot of forces uh, and, and, and a lot of time. So it's an extremely challenging uh, and difficult uh, approach to enact. But South Korea is investing substantial sums of money in this approach. And just here are some of the key capabilities that they're, they're looking at or have invested in. In terms of strike, they have large numbers of indigenously designed air, sea, and ground launch cruise missiles. Uh, they also have a active, um, are arguably one of the world's most active conventional ballistic missile programs with large numbers of short and very short range ballistic missiles. And obviously they have a relatively advanced air, uh, air force uh, most advanced planes they're operating now are the F-15K, which is the uh, Korean equivalent to the F-15 Strike Eagle or F-15E, and they're introducing the F-35 at the moment, and, and arming, and they have the ability to arm them with, uh, with advanced cruise missiles and other precision weapons. In terms of missile defense, uh, they have Patriot missiles and Pac-2 and Pac-3 variety. They have their own indigenously designed systems uh, using are uh, reportedly using Russian technology, including the KM SAM, which is the kind of the Korean equivalent of the Patriot. Uh, they have three Aegis destroyers and more are being introduced in the coming years. And obviously, there's also US systems, including FAD and the advanced Patriots already deployed in Peninsula as well. And I think one area that South Korea is really weak on and still remains weak is, in, it is uh, ISR. So they have an ongoing satellite program, but at the moment, if they would like independent uh, imagery from North Korea, they actually rely on South Korean commercial companies to get that. But that is being developed as we speak. They also have purchased four Global Hawk uh, UAVs from the US and have their own indigenous um, development program ongoing at the moment and operate a range of ISR aircraft, but many analysts have argued that this uh, number of aircraft is insufficient for what South Korea is trying to do. So essentially it is very difficult to enact, it's very expensive, but South Korea is investing a huge amount of resources into doing this. So what is the logic behind this strategy? Well, obviously the first one is North Korea nuclear developments. North Korea's nuclear program is advancing at a pace. It is a nuclear power at this stage and it has reliable and deliverable uh, nuclear weapons that can be placed upon uh, short and, and medium range ballistic missiles. Alongside that are fears, and these fears have been longstanding of the US abandonment. Now it's worth just speaking a little bit about what that means. Uh, there is a, a very low percentage chance that the alliance will collapse or the US would not defend South Korea. And certainly the system is designed to operate in that scenario. But also South Korea is looking at the possibility that the US may be engaged elsewhere or would not be able to um, engage fully with North Korea, given maybe uh, something happening with China or in another theater. So South Korea is looking to have an independent capability in case the US is simply not able to help to a sufficient degree. And obviously underneath those two are, as Henry described, the deterrent effect of conventional counterforce capabilities, but also the defensive effect of these, of these capabilities. If war does break out, even non-nuclear war does break out, many of these systems have extreme utility in a, a war time scenario with North Korea. And then finally, in the article that we wrote, we argue that these systems, particularly the ballistic missile uh, capabilities, could be part of a future nuclear hedge or nuclear program, essentially having an active, um, an active and successful ballistic missile program radically increases South Korea's nuclear latency. So these are some of the rationales behind this strategy. But as Henrik talked about before, there are significant strategic implications for this. The first we can talk about is, is there a Korean Peninsula arms race? Now this is somewhat controversial, some analysts are reluctant to state that what the US or what South Korea is doing is driving North Korean responses. But nevertheless, it is worth noting that North Korea has rapidly introduced capabilities designed to bypass some of these initiatives. 
For example, the ability to launch most, multiple weapons simultaneously, the ability to, to, to launch variable trajectory missiles and things like that. So essentially what North Korea is doing is very logically and very understandably designing around these missile defenses that, uh, that South Korea, the United States, and, and beyond that, Japan is introducing. Of course, there's also a question of the US alliance and is are these capabilities altering this alliance? And in two ways you can argue it is. In one way, and some would argue in a negative way, it is giving South Korea a lot more freedom operationally and reducing their reliance on the United States. And to some extent, it seems like the US is relatively happy for this to happen. For example, when President Moon met President Biden uh, a few days ago, the US agreed to remove all restrictions on South Korean weapons development. And we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want to. But on the other side, for the United States, it could provide an opportunity for the alliance and the alliance role to expand beyond the Korean Peninsula. And it's worth noting that in developing this conventional counterforce ca capability, South Korea is now one of the most well-armed strike in terms of strike capabilities countries in the world and will be quite useful when it comes to any scenario with China. But on the more negative side, obviously this can significantly impact the chances of denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. Increasingly, it is difficult to separate uh, North Korean nuclear weapons from South Korean conventional systems. So any nuclear deal might require some form of arms control on both sides, which would be understandably very difficult to enact for South Korea. As South Korea is not only looking at North Korea, but also developments in the region, which require substantial arming from the perspective of Seoul. And this leads me to the concept of regional missile proliferation, where South Korea is looking at China, looking at Japan, looking at Taiwan, and saying, we need to have our own capabilities. And these countries are all either looking at or are now investing in increasing their uh, conventional precision strike capabilities. Taiwan is an interesting case, and Japan is still kind of discussing how they're going to do this. But nevertheless, we are seeing, and I think it is inevitable, that there will be an increasingly large number of conventional missiles in East Asia in the near future. So what lessons can we draw from this from this theater for, for example, Europe. I and mean, I think it's impossible to deny that there has been a substantial and there is a planned substantial uh, buildup of standoff long range precision systems in Europe, particularly in NATO countries. This is understandable. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but what it does do is it places Russian nuclear weapons, particularly at more risk than ever before. And this is an important thing. What does this mean for nuclear stability? <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're not criticizing uh, Europe for doing this. And in many cases, we, uh, you know, some people have accused myself and Henrik of criticizing South Korea. We're not. This is the this is probably the only option they have in terms of defending themselves in a non-nuclear scenario uh, with non-nuclear weapons. But what it does mean is that we need to have a conversation about what the implications of these systems are. And it doesn't matter if we intend in Europe to use conventional systems for counterforce capabilities, but it does matter is if the opposition does perceive that they can be used. And that idea of perception and the potential use of these systems and what that, ha what that means for, for nuclear stability in Europe and in East Asia and around the world is something that, you know, hopefully this article and these presentations will, will contribute to the discussion. And with that, I think I'm dead on 12 minutes. So I will, I will stop and hand over, I think, to Kristen. Thank you very much, uh, Ian and Henrik, for those two great uh, presentations. Uh, before I give the word to Christine, uh, I would first like to remind you that the uh, Q&A and uh, Zoom chat is uh, still open. So if you have any questions, please, please feel free to uh, type them in as we go along. Um, so the next speaker, uh, is Kristin van Bruskor. She is a postdoctoral fellow uh, of political science at the University of Oslo and part of the Oslo Nuclear Project. Her research focuses on nuclear and conventional military strategy, uh, nuclear deterrence and crisis dynamics, uh, the role of information warfare in peace and conflict, uh, with an emphasis on Russian strategy and European security. So, Kristin, please, the screen is yours.
Thank you very much, uh, Karn uh, Anna, and thank you uh, for the invitation to be part of this conversation. It's great uh, to be back at IFS, even if uh, virtually. So I will make remarks about how another nuclear state, Russia, deliberates a nuclear and conventional deterrence. And I will touch on, I think, uh, uh, a number of issues relating to what Henrik and Ian have just uh, talked about regarding how Russia uh, is and has been responding in part to uh, this type of uh, challenge that uh, Ian and Henrik have uh, talked about. Russian deterrence concepts have in recent years evolved significantly to integrate and to blur, if you will, a conventional and nuclear deterrence and in a somewhat unique way. So I will make five points about how a Russian strategy has evolved uh, in the post-Cold War era to integrate nuclear and uh, conventional uh, deterrence. The first point being that in Russia, deterrence is a relatively new concept. The term deterrence has been employed as an organizing principle for Russian defense policy only after the end of the Cold War. Before this, the Russian term for deterrence as the Erzhevania was one associated primarily with describing Western policy. And the Soviet term that could be compared to this Western term deterrence would be war prevention. That Soviet concept and Clay entailed a clear distribution of labor where the Soviet political leadership was responsible for creating the political conditions to prevent war and the military leadership was responsible for creating the optimal conditions for prevailing in war if deterrence failed. So this was a slightly different uh, setup and approach than Western deterrence policy, which traditionally conceived of deterrence as a military policy aimed at achieving both the political and the military objective of deterring or preventing wars. But from uh, the early 1990s and onwards, Russian uh, military strategists started adapting the term deterrence in their deliberations of how to provide security for the new Russian state. And for the first time, uh, the Russian military doctrine that was issued in 1993 used the term deterrence to describe the main purpose of Russian nuclear weapons policy. And it said that uh, its purpose was to eliminate the danger of war by deterring aggression. Since this time, I would argue that Russia has gone big on deterrence. Russian theorists have been conceptualizing and deliberating deterrence more intensely, I would argue, in the post-Cold War period than their Western counterparts. Uh, and, and in the entire post-Cold War period, Russia has remained uh, reliant on their nuclear weapons, uniquely so, I would argue, among the great powers, because in Russian strategy, nuclear weapons serve two primary purposes. First, to deter nuclear aggression, but second, to deter not large-scale conventional aggression. The two other great powers that we habitually compare Russia with, the US and China, both conceive of nuclear weapons' uh, primary role as deterrent nuclear aggression. So Russia also seeks of obviously to deter nuclear aggression with their nuclear weapons and their nuclear modernization uh, is oriented towards securing a nuclear second strike capability that is potent enough for secure retaliation under any circumstance. So several of the new Russian weapon systems that we hear a lot about uh, in the West uh, are capabilities that Russia is pursuing with the explicit purpose of ensuring a Russian survivable uh, uh, and secure second strike capability. Examples of this are the avant-garde, the status six and the uh, Budavestnik capabilities that all contribute to a Russian capacity to survive any potential first strike and overcome any defensive hurdle uh, that may stand in the way of their retaliation. But since the early 1990s, Russia's nuclear weapons have also served to deter large-scale conventional aggression. Russia believes that it could be vulnerable to the superior conventional of an adversary and so promises nuclear first use in the event of such large-scale aggression, so much along the lines of this uh, challenge that Henrik and Ian have just uh, talked about. 
And this is a, a challenge that Russian strategists have been preoccupied with for some time. Uh, the first Gulf War demonstrated uh, the uh, for them the start of the revolution in military affairs that they had been uh, theorizing about for some time. They became then very concerned about uh, the potency of conventional strike capabilities and how uh, they could attain the strategic characteristics that thus far had been reserved for nuclear weapons. And they started expressing this concern that in the future, at least, a conventionally superior adversary could potentially neutralize or at least significantly cripple the Russian nuclear capability. So from this point onwards, Russia started explicitly promising nuclear retaliation in the face of large scale uh, conventional aggression. That is, Russia started promising nuclear first use. And um, I think it's interesting that Western scholars and policymakers have been making a significant point of this in recent years, including here in Norway, uh, as if they just discovered that Russian nuclear strategy is one of nuclear first use. Uh, if, if we only now discovered this, it must have been because we have not been paying attention as Russia promise, has promised this type of nuclear first use since President Yeltsin announced this first in 1993. My third point is that Russia now knits conventional nuclear deterrence very tightly together. So the early 1990s was the starting point for an intense and sustained debate in Russian military and security policy circles that spans several decades. And it, that's about the requirements of effective deterrence. How could Russia influence the calculations of a potential adversary, a pot potentially superior adversary? And what types of threats would Russia be able to deter with its nuclear and conventional capabilities? Russian strategists' concern about their own ability to deter conventional attacks intensified further in the 1999 Kosovo bombing, a NATO operations that demonstrated two, two critical things to the Russian leadership. First, that Western conventional precision uh, strike munitions and their means of delivery were improving fast and that the Russians were lagging severely. But second, that NATO, the Western alliance, was willing to make use of this strategic tool uh, without a UN Security Council mandate to unseat regimes that it did not like. And this political development was perhaps as concerning to Moscow as the military technological development. The idea that NATO could one day wake up and think about a conventional bombing assault on Moscow produced a significant strategic problem uh, for the Russians. So I think it's fair to say that Russian military planners have never lived through this period of rosy relations in the post-Cold War period that some Western countries entertained, uh, wherein the West deterrence and nuclear deterrence hit the back burner, as the director uh, Sierlinge just um, uh, mentioned, and where security policy debates were fully reoriented toward counterinsurgency and capacity building. In Russia, the strategic challenge of deterring a conventionally superior adversary never really receded from the minds of the general Russian general staff. My fourth point is that uh, in recent years, Russia has been increasingly preoccupied with conventional and unconventional deterrence and the role that it plays in an overall strategic deterrence concept. So from some time in the late, for some time in the late 1990s and early 2000s, Russia did rely on its nuclear weapons to deter most types of conventional aggression for a lack of conventional response options. At this point in time, the Russian conventional military was in an absolutely dire state. But even at that time, several Russian theorists and leaders were uncomfortable with a lowered nuclear threshold. And furthermore, they argued that nuclear threats were not credible to deter the increasingly complex and non-conventional threats that Russia uh, would be facing, such as the threat of color revolution or the threat of small-scale conventional aggression. They argued that additional non-nuclear capabilities would be needed to credibly deter the full range of threats that Russia would be facing. So from around 2005 and onwards, Russian theorists start deliberating a much more complex strategic deterrence concept that included non-nuclear or conventional uh, deterrence uh, capabilities. And today, Russia defines its overall concept of strategic deterrence as a system of forceful and non-forceful measures carried out in a consistent way by one state to restrain another from any possible coercive actions that would inflict strategic damage on the state.
It should be strategic deterrence in the Russian uh, vernacular is an activity that should be carried out continuously, both in peacetime and wartime, not only to prevent coercive actions, but also to keep the target state contained and to prevent the escalation of military conflict. And today, this concept involves a range of capabilities that Russia has at, at its disposal to influence how its adversaries think about the costs associated with a conflict with Russia. It includes inter alia uh, Russian nuclear capabilities uh, that serve as the backbone of any credible deterrence. It includes Russian conventional capabilities such as precision strike uh, capabilities, air and missile defense capabilities. It includes also non-conventional capabil capabilities such as cyber capabilities, the range of tools that Russia includes in its concept of information confrontation and novel and emerging technologies. And it also includes the range of other tools available to the Russian state that can serve to influence its environs, including diplomatic, economic, informational, ideological and scientific uh, tools. So this concept of deterrence that the Russians are now uh, espousing and, and uh, talking about and making use of has evolved to capitalize on the relationship between these different types of capabilities and moved also uh, not only across the nuclear and conventional realm, but also into the non-conventional realm of, for example, information conf uh, operation or confrontation. But more, most thoroughly theorized is the relationship between nuclear and conventional deterrent capabilities, where the found or one foundational idea is that the credibility of nuclear deterrence increases with the expansion of conventional deterrent capabilities. In turn, those expanded options for dealing with a range of conventional threats rests on a basis of nuclear deterrence, without which Russian strategists argue at least there would be no deterrent effect of the conventional capability alone. So better conventional capabilities make more credible the threat to ultimately use nuclear weapons in crisis or conflict that are so severe that they threaten the existence of the state. Russian theorists have expanded significantly on how conventional or and, and also non-conventional deterrent tools can serve to inflict unacceptable damage on an adversary. And uh, they theorize about how those levels of unacceptable damage are likely to be subjective and differ from uh, adversary to adversary. So this integration or blurring of the lines between uh, nuclear and conventional deterrence has several advantages according to Russian strategists. First, it makes possible the deterrence of a broader range of threats, also those where a nuclear response is not credible. It makes possible the capitalization of deterrent utility across domains. So the nuclear potential makes conventional threats more cr credible, which includes then the, this uh, strategic or deterrent utility of dual capable systems. And forceful deterrent means or military deterrent means make non-military deterrent means or threats more credible. This expanded range of deterrent means also makes it possible to increase the nuclear threshold, which has been a, this key incentive for Russian theorists to expand the deterrence concept. They too, like their Western brethren, do not want a nuclear war. What they do want is to capitalize on their nuclear and conventional capabilities to maximize Russian security. My fifth and final point are that there are significant risks and challenges associating with this blurring of the lines between nuclear and conventional uh, deterrence. During peacetime, Western leaders continue to perceive uh, a low Russian nuclear threshold, in part because of a sustained Russian emphasis on its nuclear capabilities. The very close association between nuclear and conventional deterrence in Russia means that for adversaries, these two aspects of Russian strategy are very difficult to disaggregate. In conflict uh, or wartime, Russian deterrence concepts demand a lot from a potential adversary. For example, by presuming that an adversary will understand that the Russian use of conventional force is an act of restraint rather than an act of aggression. Uh, that is, that Russia is not using nuclear weapons. And that, and that Russia, by using conventional force, may be seeking to stabilize the political military situation by way of this action. 
Western confusion regarding the Russian threshold for nuclear use also entails risk of escalation if Western interlocutors believe that Russia will use nuclear weapons before it is likely to do so, then Western actions to counter this may in turn trigger a Russian uh, nuclear uh, response. Finally, for Western policymakers, it remains very difficult to determine uh, before or during a conflict where precisely the Russian threshold for responding to conventional aggression with nuclear weapons lies. This is in part intentional, of course, but it will also serve to infuse any conflict between Russia and the West with a significant nuclear shadow and with uh, potentially a mutual expectation that any such conflict will escalate, a, a dynamic that in itself uh, may produce significant nuclear risk. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Christine, for uh, your insightful presentation. And the same goes to all of the speakers, uh, which I think have uh, shared insights and on this highly relevant and difficult topic. Um, and I can see that we already have some questions uh, in the Zoom chat. So uh, I think I will begin uh, by uh, asking the first one, uh, which is uh, from uh, Eirik Tushval, and it's a question for uh, Henrik. Um, you said that building a conventional long strike capability will be more expensive than establishing a nuclear program. This seems surprising to me. Could you please uh, expand on this point? Thank you. Sure, um, and that's that's a good question. Um, and uh, perhaps, um, I mean, I should have phrased that a little bit more carefully in a sense, um, because establishing a nuclear capability is is pretty difficult. That's a, a pretty you know significant threshold to cross. And I mean, in the North Korean case, it took them years to uh, to build a. Uh, I mean, both. Uh, the capabilities they needed to produce fissile materials uh, for weapons and, you know, to build um, uh, ballistic missiles that could carry nuclear weapons. But um, the point was, if you have that nuclear weapons capability, as the North Koreans do by now, then, um, you know, expanding on that capability is potentially cheaper than building all of the conventional capabilities you need to, to target it. Um, and I mean, it's a matter of several things. One that's, is that, I mean, it's, as, as Ian also mentioned, really, really complex to build um, everything you need uh, to have a conventional counterforce capability. I mean, it's not only the strike systems in themselves, the precision strike capability, it's the full range of ISR that is needed. And it's um, also, you know, missile defense, uh, which, which is complex. Furthermore, you need redundancy because like you can't afford to miss. Um, you need to build, if it is to be uh, at least somewhat credible, a capability that could potentially target everything. Um, one thing that we mentioned in the article also, uh, which, which complicates this even further is that, I mean, even if North Korea hasn't produced enough fissile material for, for you know, um, a lot of weapons yet, it could potentially hide its nuclear warheads um, and you know make it challenging to to sort of distinguish which which missiles are carrying nuclear weapons and which missiles are are, are not. Um, so so basically that would potentially unless you have fantastic intelligence entail that you would need to hit all of North Korea's missiles. Um, and um, I mean uh, it's it's. It's the complexity of this that, that makes it uh, challenging the full range of, of capabilities uh, that you would need. In addition to that, final thing to mention is the readiness that's required, at least in the South Korean case, where you need to you know, be ready to enact this potentially within like minutes, uh, less than half an hour. Um, and since you could never really discount the possibility of, of a surprise attack, um, the readiness needs to be sustained pretty much at all times. And that's really costly and demanding uh, for the South Korean uh, forces. So, I mean, at least in the South Korean case, but I think it would it would apply in many other cases. If, if you have an actor that already 
has crossed the nuclear threshold and which is the nuclear weapon states, it is really difficult to to build all of this. Not impossible and not uh, you know not worthwhile necessarily, but but demanding. Thank you. Um, so building on that, then uh, you mentioned uh, North Korea, and um, I mean, uh, wouldn't a simple solution be to you know aim for full uh, disarmament uh, on the K uh, Korean Peninsula. Um, and uh, I mean, what are the efforts uh, uh, to make North Korea in this case, uh, for example, give up its nuclear weapons? It doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest from the North Korean side to engage with uh, the new Biden administration, uh, at least as long as they don't get any uh, of the sanctions lifted. And, and the Biden administration seem, um, at least uh, as far as I understand, more uh, interested uh, in uh, uh, forging closer ties with South Korea and Japan, which isn't really a North Korea uh, uh, policy in a sense. So uh, could you perhaps, and I would like to bring in Ian as well, uh, could you elaborate on the efforts to, um, to, uh, to try and, um, uh, reach this is uh, disarmament uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Sure, and I I think Ian should join in on this one. I I can just start off by saying that I think um, I mean we're very far away from making uh, the North Koreans uh, denuclearize. Uh, I don't think the prospects for that happening anytime soon are are. Um, are very good at the moment. Uh, if anything, they're expanding their nuclear capabilities. Um, okay, they're not testing long-range missiles at the moment, or, or and they haven't tested nuclear weapons in a while. But nevertheless, uh, the program seems to be expanding, and they, I mean, crossed a lot of critical thresholds in in, in terms of actually having a a a, a capability. Um, and I mean. Um, Ian could fill in on this too, but um, as we say, um, or as we've argued, um, the South Korean uh, strategy and the potential arms race on, on the peninsula that we're seeing isn't making this any easier. Because uh, traditionally, the, the South Koreans have relied, or sorry, the North Koreans have relied also on um, like their conventional artillery as, as a, a form of det uh, deterrence, its ability to, to strike Seoul with, uh, with artillery as a form of deterrence. But the advanced cap capabilities that the South Koreans are building are at least undermining uh, that conventional deterrence that, that North Korea has had too. Uh, so that just puts a further premium uh, on, on nuclear weapons for the, for the North Koreans. But, um, but Ian. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, at the moment, I think, uh... We don't know the details of what the new administration in Washington's North Korea policy is. They've been classified, which is problematic. But the reports, or from what we can discern from the uh, from the public pronouncements, is that it seems pretty conservative and doesn't seem like they are they're willing to take any any risk. And I think this point of risk is quite important that someone needs to take a substantial risk if denuclearization is going to happen. And for the U.S., that would be with with security in, in terms of you know giving North Korea added incentives to give up North, nuclear weapons and for now the, the US, South Korea, Japan, no one is giving North Korea any incentives to give up nuclear weapons and you might see with sanctions relief some form of um, freezing or, or something like that or maybe even arms control but again we're not seeing that kind of major step yet from the Biden administration. If you're North Korea it becomes very difficult to see why you would give up nuclear weapons, not just because of US and, and South Korea, but if you look at the regional picture because of what's happening with China, everyone is arming. And if you get rid of North Korea's nuclear weapons, North Korea becomes the weakest state in East, or in East Asia very quickly. And uh, you know, all of a sudden they are at risk from many sides rather than just one. So I think North Korea has substantial reasons to maintain its nuclear capability and very little incentive to, to get rid of it. And no one on the other side is seeming willing to take any major steps beyond what we've seen before. You know, we're, talk, we're back talking about family reunions as the first step. And this has been done 
you know, ad nauseum and we're, we're kind of nowhere opening up this kind of South Korean tourism thing. So I, I think at the moment, denuclearization, as Henrik said, is it, just not going to happen. There's no incentive and there's no real um, real logic behind behind it uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of you know strategic logic, economic logic. It just doesn't it just doesn't seem to be working uh, on, on any level for either side. And I think the security situation in East Asia just precludes it from from actually happening in, in the in the short to medium term at least. Thank you. Um, so moving um well the west uh for now um kristin there's a question uh, to you from the audience um where anders uh, rumerheim is wondering if you could elaborate a bit on why russian nuclear first use has sort of been neglected for so long even though it was articulated in 1993 is it simply a case of statements changing meaning and or importance with increased levels of tensions and confrontations? Um, do you have some insights to share? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for the question, Anish. Um, yeah, no, I think uh, that the, the, the one part of the answer to that question is, is simply um, the Western level of attention to uh, Russian deliberations regarding its uh, security and, and deterrence strategy in, in, uh, the in the 1990s and the 2000s. I think that at that point in time, rela uh, political relations between Russia and the, w and the West were, were at least in, in long periods of time significantly improved and that, uh, and, and that, that uh, the, the end of the Cold War led to an, uh, sort of an abandonment of the, of the study of, of Russian strategic intentions, at least as compared to the level of attention that, that uh, had been associated with this during the Cold War. Uh, but and then I also think that a another part of the reason was uh, linked to this interpretation of Soviet nuclear strategy and and of the Soviet promise of no first use, which uh, most Western uh, analysts didn't really believe in or, or attach much value to. So most Western uh, analysts and strategists believed that uh, Russia, in fact, had uh, that the Soviet Union, in fact, had a first use policy, even if they promised nuclear no first use. So I think that the analysts who were paying attention in the early 1990s uh, sort of drew the conclusion that this doesn't really entail any particular change since we, we believe that this was Soviet policy all along, whereas in fact, as far as I can understand, the, the conventional challenge that Russian strategists perceived in the early 1990s was something substantively different from what Soviet strategists had perceived of in the 1980s. So the threat or the challenge that the Russian Federation was facing was in fact substantively different and, and that uh, in part influenced this change in declaratory uh, policy. But I think that, uh, that to some extent it also stems from this uh, neglect uh, uh, in the uh, Western uh, analytic community uh, of uh, Russian nuclear intentions in this period. And that it's only when we in the West perceive of a change in Russian foreign policy intentions in the late 2000s and uh, from 2014 in particular that people actually start paying attention to what had been going on in Russian strategy circles for then several decades. Thank you, Kristin. Um, so building somewhat on uh, on what you just said, because you know, um, I guess part of the the um, the discussion is you know in many regards like how perhaps in the West you know after the end of history and haven't been really paying attention to all the various um, uh, dynamics and changes that's been occurring, uh, at least perhaps not taking it uh, seriously enough um, and. Um, I would like to bring perhaps the discussion uh, to uh, the question of arms control. And uh, you've all been, and this is a question for all of you because you've been touching on, you know, the emerging technology and, and how we should deal with uh, uh, the, the blurring of lines. And, you know, the, um, I guess my question to, to you is, um, what are the implications of the entanglement uh, for nuclear arms control uh, more broadly? And uh, uh, I guess to 
is it possible for arms control uh, to incorporate the emerging technology? Um, and I don't know who, who would like to begin, but uh, it's a question to, to all of you. And I saw Henrik smiling, so that means he gets to start. Well, well, thanks for putting me on the spot there. Um, no, but uh, that is a, a, a really uh, important and uh, also difficult uh, question. Um, because, I mean, I think the basic perhaps answer to this is that it's, in many contexts at least, increasingly difficult to sort of imagine um, arms control uh, without incorporating in one sense or another uh, some of these conventional capabilities. As well, and I think that applies in in, in several settings. Um, as mentioned in uh, the context of denuclearization on the peninsula, uh, you know, um, even if I'm very pessimistic about the prospects of that, um, uh, it's relevant there too because I mean it's hard to imagine the North Koreans um, agreeing to anything uh, without some sort of arms control that would put limits on on South Korean conventional capabilities. Um, uh, so we have it in, in that context. Um, just to, to, to bring that into um, the, the, the China uh, context and Chinese views of arms, uh, arms control, uh, which I've been working on um, as well. Um, I mean, the Chinese, what they want uh, in terms of arms control are limits on advanced conventional capabilities. They're not that interested in, in limits on, on uh, nuclear capabilities. Um, what they would want from any sort of arms control uh, regime would be first and foremost limitations on US missile defense, uh, but potentially also uh, limitations on conventional position strike capabilities, such as, for instance, forward deployed uh, land based uh, capabilities that the US is considering to deploy, I mean, in, in East Asia now uh, with the demise of the INF Treaty. Um, but the challenge is, of course, that, that integrating so many different elements into a, a regime quickly becomes very complex. Um, if you have, you know, not only several capabilities, but also potentially several uh, parties, you know, uh, not only the US and Russia anymore, but, but I mean, if you want to include China in arms control, uh, in some sense, you know, there is no uh, or I think at least that it's very difficult to, to um, not include these conventional capabilities in the mix as well. But I don't have any you know, good answer as to how you would actually do it and what an acceptable uh, agreement could look like. Um, but I don't think there's any doubt that they need to be in the picture. Kristin, did you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, no, yeah, I would just uh, reinforce what uh, Henrik said with regard to uh, the need to uh, probably account for somehow this, at least this relationship between uh, conventional nuclear uh, technologies and, and weapon systems. And, and I think that one sort of critical aspect to keep in mind is that is um i mean i so i talked about this russian so uh, what i call this unique russian deterrence concept which responds to the particular security challenges that russia perceives and and those are different from the security challenges the, the united states perceives and different from the security challenges that china perceives which in turn has repercussions for what role nuclear weapons play in their respective strategies for ensuring state security and it's that asymmetry with regard to the utility of nuclear weapons versus the utility of conventional weapons in these state strategies that that have significant repercussions for what they will be willing to concede with regard to different uh, military technologies so i think it's a it's a bit of a, a wicked problem that's not to say that that it's impossible to envisage uh, solutions but but that you may have to sort of get creative somehow with regard to taking account of how uh, placing limits on one particular technology will basically have different repercussions for the different states who participate in these uh, deliberations. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ian, I don't know if you would like to add something or if you are quite happy um okay uh well uh i will make sure to ask you a question uh nonetheless um 
So uh, again, um, moving to the European scene, uh, we have a question from Lucas Kulesa. And uh, he was wondering, Ian, if you could expand, expand on your consequences for Europe slides, uh, especially the effects of several relatively mid-sized slash small players, including Norway, Poland, Finland, acquiring long range uh, strike systems and the option of deployment of conventional ground-based intermediate range missiles by US and NATO. That's a long question. Um, the countries in question would probably argue uh, these are stabilizing measures, boosting deterrence, uh, given Russian capabilities. And Kristin, I would uh, like for you to comment on this after Ian has given his answer. Great, thanks. I think that the, the, the final point is perfectly valid. There is an entire school of thought that if you, you know, you, you build your own capabilities to match those of the opposition, then, you know, th this will both will bolster deterrence. I think the point we were trying to make is that we are on a little bit of uncertain ground right now. And it's not just the procurement of, as, as he said, you know, precision strike capabilities, but it's, it's an entire package of things that are coming online or soon to come online that Russia might find or perceive as changing their, their, their specific uh, threat picture. And things like prompt global strike, which is a US capability, a cooperative engagement capability, which is, you know, getting allies and other and multi-services to work together, which increases range, increases precision, increases lethality, theoretically, uh, you know, linked to multi-domain operations, all of these different concepts coming online, which are radically changing, or radically, not radically, but, you know, substantially changing the lethality of conventional systems, and particularly from range, that all of a sudden make, you know, you know, render certain aspects that Russia may have seemed secure or the opposition may have seemed secure before no longer secure now. And so uh, that is the key point. And like, I'm not picking on Norway. I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, by the way. I'm just saying this is the conversation. So if you just look at Norway, for example, they replaced the F-16 with a substantial number of F-35 fighter planes, fighter aircraft. The F-35 is a massive, well, some would argue, many would argue it's a, it's, a, it's a large increase in lethality, particularly offensive lethality, right? So no longer is Norway with F-16s that are, that are manageable. They now have a strike fighter, which is stealthy, which is designed to penetrate enemy airspace or operate in contested airspace with long range precision missiles that could theoretically operate, you know, uh, in range of the Cold Peninsula. And this changes the calculation. Now, Norway may never ever intend or have doctrine or have operational concepts that would do that, but it doesn't matter if Russia thinks they could, right? And, and, and that is the key. And that is just the point I'm trying to make. Now, maybe Krishna has a different view of how Russia perceives these, but if you look at this from a kind of a, a, an overview level, you know, just things are changing and we need to have a conversation about what this could look like and what the effects of this would be, you know, over the, over the short term, medium term moment. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with uh, Ian. I think he makes uh, great points about how the, uh, the, the point is that we need to have this conversation about what these repercussions are in terms of adversarial strategy and how they will, uh, how, what the next steps uh, will be. And I think that, uh, I mean, uh, Ian points to that this is somewhat uncertain ground, but, but to some extent, I would argue that in the Russian context, it's not because this is the challenge that they've been deliberating since the 1990s. And we, so we have seen already how they are responding to the challenge of conventional counterforce combined with missile defenses combined with other potential uh, technologies that they're concerned about, such as, um, you know, left of launch uh, capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we already know a fair bit about that response. Um, and uh, yeah, to Lukas, I guess, uh, yeah, no, I mean, my point would just be to reiterate that, that, that uh, it, it's not to say that uh, NATO states should not be deploying these types of capabilities. But when we talk about whether this will have a stabilizing effect, then I think we also need to be quite careful with our terminology. I mean, I totally agree with you, Lukash, that most NATO countries would would um, 
expressed that this has a stabilizing effect, but that's not the way the Russians are going to perceive it. So, so we may conceive of this as a stabilizing effect in terms of, you know, the uh, balance of forces becoming equalized somehow. But, but whether that actually stabilizes the situation in Europe in peacetime or in wartime is a somewhat different question, I think. Yeah, it's it's not easy when everyone uh, says uh, they're doing things for defensive purposes only, and the other side views it as offensive. Um, so uh, I would like to bring in a question from Eista and Tunsha, and this is uh, a long one for you, Henrik. So. Uh, uh, I'll just begin. Uh, on blurring lines, you emphasized more capable conventional weapon systems, precision, long range, missile defense, etc. But why does this matter? Leading nuclear states like the US, Russia and China seek to have a nuclear arsenal that can survive a first strike with nuclear weapons. Why is conventional weapons blurring the lines? So if you build a nuclear arsenal that should survive nuclear attack, why should conventional weapons make any difference? Um, thanks, that's an excellent question. And I think, uh, I mean, perhaps Kirsten could jump in on the, the Russian side of, of, of things there too. Um, I think, I mean, uh, you could argue that, I mean, um, Chinese, for, for instance, uh, I mean, nuclear deterrence uh, and its deterrence strategy has been based on first strike uncertainty. Uh, they haven't been that cautious about the sort of balance of forces and, and the risks of, of, of counterforce, as long as there's been a chance of, of retaliation. Uh, they've been quite content uh, with that. They have had a more relaxed nuclear posture, so to say, uh, than, than, than the US or in Russia, and, and, and that's a choice. But I think um, if you look at what Chinese strategists write, what they're interested in and what they perceive as threatening, it's striking that you know the main focus isn't on nuclear uh, counterforce capabilities. Uh, it is on uh, missile defense and conventional prompt global strike. Um, and increasingly also, uh, I mean, ground-based missiles being deployed in, uh, in East uh, Asia, um, as well as capabilities such as uh, left of launch, uh, as, as Kirsten also mentioned. So there, I mean, there's some pretty striking similarities in threat perceptions actually between, between China and Russia, it seems. And I think, I mean, there are sort of two challenges that the Chinese uh, see. One is that this could uh, challenge their uh, no first use policy. Uh, how do you respond if there is a conventional attack on your on your nuclear forces? Do you go nuclear? Um, what do you do? Um, but perhaps more seriously, um, I think there is a concern, and then you could argue whether this is uh, a, a, a legitimate one or not. But but there is a concern that the threshold for for striking with conventional weapons that it's lower than, than a nuclear counterforce strike. So that in, in a crisis, uh, even if you know it's still quite remote, the chances of the US trying to uh, disarm China with conventional weapons is somewhat higher than, than the US trying to disarm uh, China with, with nuclear weapons, uh, for instance. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I think that is, that is part of the, of the picture. Uh, Combined with the fact that you know uh, they they see a a a, a threat to um, to to the arsenal from you know um, more not only more potent precision strike capabilities but also anti-submarine warfare uh, targeting of the of the um, uh, sea-based deterrent that they're trying to build. Um, so, so I mean, even if this hasn't led to like a major nuclear buildup on on part of the Chinese, I I think this concern is is definitely driving a response uh, with a, a renewed and stronger emphasis on nuclear modernization. Kristen, do you have uh, a Russian take on Einstein's question? Or uh, I have my take on the Russian take. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I, no, I, I would agree with uh, Henrik. I think, uh, I mean, yeah, you are of course right to to state Einstein that um, 
uh, states like Russia seek to have a ar nuclear arsenal that can survive a first strike with nuclear weapons, but that's not to say that all their nuclear weapons are uh, fully survivable or uh, um, impossible to uh, strike or, or, or eliminate with conventional capabilities. It's not, I mean, all their weapons are not in hardened uh, silos and I th and it's the as we talked about earlier I think it's the it's also the combination of capabilities so in the Russian context it's also the missile defense uh, capability that you know that can mop up their uh, what they have left of their retaliatory capability so it's the combination of the several conventional capabilities that can impact their their ability to uh, in Inf uh, inflict unacceptable damage on an adversary. So, that, so I think that's also something to keep in mind that it's in the Russian context at least their threshold for survivable forces is uh, relatively high. I mean, they, in in terms of their uh, doctrinal deliberations, they talk about how they should be able to inflict unacceptable damage on an adversary under any circumstances. So that is, despite any uh, potentially conventional uh, strike or uh, defensive systems, they should nevertheless be able to inflict unacceptable damage on, a, on an adversary such as the United States. And that means that if you have a couple or a, a dozen missiles that, are, that have survived, that may not be sufficient. But I think it's also related. I think that Henrik's point also about this, uh, the perceived threshold for using conventional force is also a, a really, really important uh, issue that, that sort of uh, makes this challenge is, into something substantively different than the challenge of nuclear counterforce. Hey, thank you. Uh, and I stand to intro also has a question for uh, Ian. Um... And he's wondering if South Korea's uh, increased conventional capabilities have any deterrence effect on China. Uh, uh, does it affect South Korea's deterrence and reassurance policy? And could there be a lesson learned for Norway? Uh, thanks. Um, does it, okay, so very quickly. Um, until recently, most of the South Korean military is not considered China uh, as, a, as a deterrent target, let's put it that way, mainly because of the focus on North Korea. The only exception has been the South Korean Navy, which is which has really looked at China closely for the last 15, 20 years. And, and their deterrence concept has been one of, you know, maintaining capabilities such as submarines, which can, you know, create a kind of short, sharp shock effect, you know, or impose costs, you know, relative to whatever gain North China would have for whatever action it may take. And it seems that this is the approach that South Korea is taking to its, its conventional weapon systems and, and China, that if China does do something, and again, it's very unclear what they are deterring, but if they do do something that requires the use of conventional force, that South Korea will be able to, to be able to use these systems against, you know, very high value targets uh, or, or make something so costly as, as it's, not, it's just not worth it. But it's very, very difficult to kind of unpack exactly what South Korea's, you know, China deterrence policy is, because it is, it is not talked about in any way publicly, unlike, you know, the, the North Korean scenario. But I think that's how you would, you, South Korea would view this in a China, in a, in a China context. As for the second part of the question, does it affect, you know, South Korea's deterrence and reassurance policy? At the moment, whether they have a deterrence and reassurance policy is, is, is in the same way as Norway is, as maybe up for debate, but, um, uh, insofar as the reassurance part of South Korea's China approach it has been to not network its systems with the United States. And that has been the main part of it. Uh, and we saw that with that, uh, with the Thad um, incident that happened in 2016 uh, in, in the last few years. So right now, China seems relatively okay with South Korea developing its own capabilities. But there might be some more pushback if, if they network them up more closely with the US. And we're not seeing that right now and that seems to be the line that 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 uh the us is happy with south korea is happy with and, and china is happy with but as i said in the, in the presentation um we don't really know what this kind of non-networked cooperative engagement kind of uh, or cooperative use would look like in an operational scenario between south korea and the us and, and maybe it's closer than, than we think so i'm not sure if it has a lesson for for norway uh, other than, you know, both sides, Norway and South Korea have, you know, close ties with the US. 
and when both sides get closer to you know the US, China and, and Russia tend to push back a little bit as well. Okay, so uh, we don't have that many minutes left. Uh, so what I will do, I will incorporate a final uh, question, which is to uh, the entire panel, and I will ask you to be uh, brief when answering it. Um, and the question is from Mikhail uh, uh, Kuprianov. Uh, and the question is, what do you consider to be the effect of arms control on strategic culture, both in terms of conventional and nuclear arms? And this is uh, a rather a big question, uh, perhaps to answer in two minutes, but perhaps um, Ian, if you would just like to continue and we'll go through the round. <laughs> or perhaps does it have an effect on strategic culture? Um, it's, it's a very interesting question in, in what, 30 seconds. Uh, I think it, it's, would need to have an effect on strategic culture if we're going to connect both conventional and nuclear arms in, in some sort of arms control scenario. But at the moment, I don't, we don't see it happening. But yes, if, if, if it's going to work, I think many countries will need to change their strategic culture and how they view particularly the procurement and, and use of, of, of conventional weapons. Okay, um, Henrik? Oh, I think Ian put it quite well there. I, 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 I mean, I just concur. I think um, there is a, a need to rethink arms control, basically, uh, if it is to have any progress uh, with these technological uh, changes and, and hence perhaps, you know, um, how, you know, strategic culture and how we, how we think about um, arms control. Um, uh, and issues such as verification and, and, and all the, I mean, traditional arms control conundrums. Um, but I think that's as far as I, uh, I can take it within, uh, within uh, 30 th seconds or so. So I'll um, leave the rest of this, uh, of the challenge to, to Kirsten. Yeah, I don't know if I have a good, uh, a good uh, answer uh, to this, uh, but, but uh, I, I think that, I mean, there is certainly some uh, link between the, the, the two, I think, in terms of uh, how different uh, states and the security policy uh, elites within the states perceive of the utility of arms control and whether they think of it as a competitive endeavor or as a cooperative endeavor that can contribute to reducing attention and in that way produce uh, security, but in a somewhat different way than, uh, than by... Um, procuring uh, arms. And I think that that goes with, I mean, that pertains both to nuclear and conventional uh, weapons, um, as well as other technologies for that matter. Okay, uh, thank you so much to all of you uh, for sharing your insights. Uh, this has been a thought provoking seminar and thank you for everyone who uh, uh, sent in your questions. Unfortunately, didn't have time to, uh, to bring in all of them, but uh, hopefully we will see you at uh, next, uh, next seminar that uh, we will be hosting. Uh, remember, you can find uh, the recording online in a couple of days. And with that, I would like to wish you all a very nice day. <laughs>